Well, thank you so much for joining us today at New Day Church Online. My name is James Yandel, and I have the privilege of being one of the pastors here at New Day Church. Uh, if this is your first time connecting with us, we're so glad that you're tuning in, no matter where you're at or who you are. We believe that God has a plan for you and a purpose, even as you watch this video. If you want to connect with our church in any way, you can go to newdaychurch.com. Uh, we would love to pray with you. We would love for you to reach out to us and get connected into the life of our church. You can find all of our information on our website. We'd also love to invite you to follow us on social media. We have a Facebook page, an Instagram page, and also a YouTube channel where you can find more encouraging content in your walk with the Lord. And then lastly, we exist here as a church to help people find their new day in Jesus' name. And if you want to do that, if you want to find your new day, that could look like a lot of different things. Maybe it's taking a step into a Bible study, or maybe it's just following Jesus for the very first time and trusting him as your Savior. Or maybe that's getting baptized. Whatever it is, we want to walk with you in your next step. You can go to newdaychurch.com, and on the very home page, you can find a button that says, Take Your Next Step. And we would love for you to click that, fill that form out, and we would love to walk with you as you grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Now we're going to listen to some encouraging worship music, and we encourage you, no matter where you're at, to sing along right in your living room, no matter where you're at. Worship the Lord today because He is good and He is amazing. And thank you so much for watching. Good morning, church. This morning, <clears throat> had something pretty specific on my heart. And um, it's actually quite simple. Uh, but I think wherever you are this morning, um, if you could just focus in on God's love and God's love for you. So many times we worship and we worship out of a place of need, out of a place of desperation. Uh, and many times we come before the Lord with like our situation and there's nothing wrong with that but this morning I just have God's love on my heart and with that I think to truly grasp the fullness of God's love we have to just kind of get rid of everything that we're thinking about and everything that we're worrying about because his love is just higher than anything else that we have going on now that's not to say that our lives don't matter or that what we have going on doesn't matter. It's more so just to say when you rely on God's love and you rest in God's love and you worship in God's love, that stuff just doesn't seem to matter as much anymore. The treasures of this world don't seem to matter anymore. The pain doesn't seem to hurt as much anymore. The struggle doesn't feel as tight as it was before. So I think wherever you're at this morning, just reposition yourself, maybe even physically. Maybe just open up your hands, close your eyes, and just begin to focus your spirit in on God's love. And I think with this comes a quietness inside of you, where we have to take all that we did an hour ago, or leading right up to watching this, and take everything that you're going to do after this, and just get that out of your mind. Get all those worries out of your head. Get all the thoughts out of your head that are distracting, that have been consuming this week. And just begin to think of God's love, how he gave his son for you. Something I usually think about in my worship times is that God chose to give his son. We know that God's creator and we know that Jesus came to die for us, but that was a choice. I think so many times we think it was this thing that was meant to be. That was something that God chose to do because he loved us, because he wanted to do that for us. And I think just letting that reality sink in is such a peaceful place to be. So let's just sing together wherever you're at. If you're in your living room, if you're in your bedroom, if you're in a group right now, let's all sing together. 
with that thought in mind of how God loves us. And higher than the mountains that I face, He's stronger than the power of the grave. Constant through the trial and the change This one thing, it remains One thing, it remains Your love, that your love never fails and never gives up and never runs out on me Yes, your love never fails and never gives up it never runs out on me. Yes, your love never fails, it never gives up. It never runs out on me, your love. I sing on and on, cause it goes on and on and on and on it goes. And for it overwhelms and satisfies my soul. I never ever have to be afraid Cause this one thing Yes it remains Sing your love Cause your love never fails It never gives up It never runs out on me And your love never fails It never gives up It never runs out on me Yes your love never fails It never gives up Never runs out on me, your love, Jesus. Cause in death, in dead life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. So I know my debt is paid. There is nothing that can separate. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Yes, your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Cause your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love, yes, your love, Jesus. Sing your love, cause your love never fails, it never gives up. You love never fails, and never gives up, and never runs out on me. Oh, I know you love and never fails, and never gives up, and never runs out on me. You love. Thank you for your love, Jesus. Thank you for your love, God. Cause yes, He Like an unforeseen kiss 
that we stand on this morning that we sing on it's your love your love conquers all things God we rest in that we thank you for that Jesus God teach us to love like you love you're the perfect example of love Lord give you praise this morning in Jesus name. Amen. Well, amen. In a moment, we're going to hear a message by Pastor John. But before we do that, uh, we want to take a moment to just honor the Lord and worship him through our giving. If you are new and this is your first time connecting with us, don't feel obligated to give at all. This service today is our gift to you in the name of Jesus. But uh, if you are one of our regular members, our partners in the gospel, we would love to invite you to continue to support New Day Church financially and our mission to help people find their new day in Jesus' name. If you want to support us and our efforts, efforts to spread the gospel and also provide COVID relief in the city of Houston, you can go to newdaychurch.com slash give. And then lastly, I want to encourage you, no matter who you are, no matter where you're at, we would love to invite you to join us for our first public gathering on June 7th. We're going to have all the social distancing measures in place. We're going to do it as safely as possible. And if you feel comfortable, is that something that you want to do? We're going to do a family style worship starting June 7th. And we would love to invite you and and your entire family to come be a part of that. And now at this time, Pastor John is going to share a message, and I encourage you just right now in this moment to open up your heart and your mind to whatever it is that God has for you today. Hi there, my name is John. Thank you for tuning in to New Day Online today. Whoever you are, wherever you're at, whenever you're tuning in, thank you so much for being a part of this with us today. We're in week two of a series called Love Your Neighbor. And the reason why we think it's so important to have this conversation right now is because our world is upside down with the shutdown and the pandemic and everything that's going on all around us. And so we think in the coming weeks, but also in the coming months and for the rest of the year, we, we really have a great opportunity as the church to be the church, to be the hands and feet of Jesus and to love people well. We, we can shine God's light during this season. And last week when we started the series, we looked at the great commandment, which is where uh, Jesus taught us that really everything in the Bible and in the commandments really comes down to loving God and loving people. And what, the way we said it was loving God is the point and loving people is the proof that we get the point, which is loving God with everything that he's given us. And so today what I want to do is I want to share with you a story that Jesus tells in the Bible that is really meant to help us understand the great impact that we can have with our life, no matter who we are or where we're from. It's the famous story, you've probably heard of it before, called the story of the Good Samaritan. It's a very well-known story. And what's kind of interesting about the Good Samaritan is it's even become like a, a cultural concept. You'll watch the news and if someone helps somebody or goes out of their way to help someone in need, they say they were a Good Samaritan. But what I want to do for us today is take us a little bit deeper into this story because I think it's more about just describing helping somebody in need, but it really gives us a, a framework and a mindset for how we can really make a difference for God in our life by loving the people around us well. And so the title today is simply just this, How to Make a Difference with Your Life. That's a message we all need, How to Make a Difference with Your Life. And this one means a lot to me as a pastor because as I um, love people and, and lead people in the local church, one of the things that I'm always struck by is 
people don't realize the potential that they have to make a difference in this world. I think so often we're focused on the wrong things or we're kind of distracted in life and we're kind of doing um, kind of side things instead of the main thing of loving God and loving people. But, but even when people really discover that really what it means to live is to love God, love people, so often uh, people just uh, don't realize how much God could do through them. They have mindsets that maybe God won't work through them or, or they can't help other people grow in their faith or they can't meet big needs in their life. We, we feel often so overwhelmed by our own life that we feel like I could never help somebody else. And yet what I think the story today shows us is that no matter who you are, God can make a big difference through your life to the people around you. So if you have your Bible, let's turn to Luke chapter 10. We're going to read verses 25 through 37. This is the well-known story of the Good Samaritan, Luke 10, 25 through 37. But what you'll notice is there'll be a whole paragraph before we even get to that parable because it's really the full context of this story. Because actually the, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan comes out of a conversation that Jesus is having with a lawyer or an expert in the law. And so I'm going to read it for us here, Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. It says this, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him, being Jesus, to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, who just so you know, was very um, overlooked and a person who was seen as unclean in Jewish uh, culture. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, you go and do likewise. May God bless the reading of this word for us today. So I want to talk to you about how to make a big difference with your life. A big difference for the kingdom with your life. And I think what happens so often when we think of the parable of the Good Samaritan or, or helping people, we jump right into the parable or the story of the Good Samaritan that Jesus tells, but we often ignore the context um, and the conversation of which the story comes up in. And so today what I want to do is kind of contrast really what I think are the two main characters in the story besides Jesus, obviously, which is like the lawyer that's trying to test Jesus, who's trying to get out of loving his neighbor, and ultimately Good Samaritan. And so at the beginning of our, our story, what we see is that Jesus is talking to an expert in the law who's trying to trip up Jesus. They're asking him all these hard questions about the law and trying to get Jesus to mess up. The lawyer asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? He says, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And it says, and Jesus said to him, well, what's written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answered, well, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, okay, you've answered correctly go do this and you will live. And you would think it would be over right there. But then the lawyer, it says, but, the, but he designed to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And so what this verse shows us right here, verse 29, is that the lawyer is not asking with the right motive. That he's not coming to Jesus wanting to learn or grow or see what Jesus would want him to do with his life. He's not open to maybe discovering God's will for his life. He's kind of got, already got the plan in his mind. He's not looking for God's will or God's path. He only wants to reinforce the agenda that he already has. And his agenda is to only love Pharisees or people that were seen as like religious and well-off. 
But the problem with this is that this guy has a lot of potential. He's a smart guy. He's a devout guy. He could have done great things for the kingdom. He could have loved so many people. But he's so set on his own agenda. He's not humble that he misses God's good plan for his life. And he also misses his impact. And the way you know that he's missing it here completely, and maybe you've never noticed this before when you've been uh, reading this passage, is that he asked Jesus a question, right? He says, and who is my neighbor? But Jesus, when he responds ultimately with a parable, he doesn't answer his question. And I think we often miss that part, right? We, we kind of skip the fact that this man is asking, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus goes into this like long story about how to be a neighbor, have you ever felt like maybe God wasn't answering you? Have you ever felt like you were asking God a question or asking God for something and either he wasn't responding or giving you anything or maybe directing your attention to other things? What I've learned in my life so often is that whenever God is not responding, often we're asking the wrong question. Often we're asking, why God, why is this happening? Instead of God, like, what are you trying to show me in this thing, God? What's the lesson that you want me to learn? That we have to come to God humbly. And so in this passage, what we see is that this lawyer has his own agenda and he's missing. Like he could be loving people. He could be reaching out to people, making a difference, but he's only coming with his own agenda and trying to prove himself and force his way on Jesus. And so when it comes to making a big difference with your life, here's the first thing. We must forsake our own agenda for a journey with Jesus. Forsake your agenda for a journey with Jesus. And I don't know who needs to hear this today, but I bet a lot of people need to hear this right here. The greatest barrier to what God could do through your life is what you thought God was going to do through your life. The greatest barrier to what God could do through your life is what you thought God was going to do through your life. The question for all of us today in the parable of the Good Samaritan as we look to love our neighbors is, are we the lawyer or the Good Samaritan? See, the lawyer comes with his own agenda, his own idea. He's asking questions, but not really wanting guidance or to change, just kind of stuck in his ways, in his traditions, and his current perception of things. He, he's not open to what God wants to say. He's got his mind made up. And then there's the Samaritan who's just journeying down the road, sees a need, and meets that need. This lawyer could have done so much for the kingdom, but he couldn't look past what he thought it should look like. And my question to you today is, are you humble about what your future or your life should look like? Are you humble and open to, to what God might do in and through you? And are you open to it maybe being different than you thought it was gonna be originally? So often we're, we're missing all the things that God is doing in our life because we're so fixated or obsessed on this one thing or this maybe certain kind of timetable of how everything is supposed to work out in our life. And God's doing so many great things, putting so many people to love in our path. And we're just kind of disappointed because it's not working out the way that we originally thought, because of course we know everything, of the way that we thought that it was supposed to play out. You see, humility, when God calls us to be humble, or in Proverbs 3, when God says to trust him with all of our heart and to lean not on our own understanding of things, what we need to know is every command that God gives us should be seen as a loving father because God says he's a loving father, giving it to us as children because he has good things for us and good plans for us. And we glorify him and find good in our lives when we listen to what he says. We, we don't just, we're not just called to be humble because it's like the right thing in the law. And so here's the thing called being humble and you go be humble. And so then when you do that, you can check it off and be a good little boy or girl. It's not just like a religious thing to do so we can say that we've justified ourselves and been good. It's a religious relationship and covenant with God. And so that means that when God says to do something, it's good and it brings good. And so the reason why it says to trust God is because ultimately, whenever you trust God, you, you open your mind to all the things that God is doing in your life. And if we're so fixated on the way it's supposed to look 
or on what we already thought, like this lawyer right here, and we come to Jesus with that, then we'll miss everything. And so the first way to make a big difference with your life is to forsake your agenda of what you thought it was supposed to look like and go on a journey with Jesus to see everything that he has with you. What if you woke up every day and you perfectly trusted God with your future? You said, okay, God, where are we going today? Is today the day, God, that this is going to happen? Or or, or God, do do you want me to wait? God, is is your good plan one of let's do this now? Or is it wait? Or or how should this work out, God? What's your will for my life, God? What if we only just wanted God's will for our our life and we just trusted every circumstance like, God, God, you will guide my path. How much anxiety would that instantly alleviate from our lives? One of my favorite passages in the entire Bible is Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. I want to read this for you. This comes from Solomon, who was the wisest man, the Bible says, who ever lived. He says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. I'm gonna read that again. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, turn away from evil, and hear this. It'll be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. And what it means to make a difference is to follow God's path to the people that he's leading us to. And and part of that is kind of forsaking this agenda and always being obsessed with how we thought our life should look or things should look so that we can step into all that God has placed right in front of us. A few years ago, Halsey, my wife, planned an amazing birthday party for me. And um, she said, I, I'm not telling you what it's going to be, but it's going to be awesome. And just make sure on your birthday you have nothing going on. And I didn't know what was going on, and, uh, but I was excited and I trusted her. And the day of my birthday was so awesome. Two of my really good friends came really early in the day. And she had planned all of these great activities. All, we, we went to Top Golf. I'd never been there. I love that place. I went to all these different places that I love to go. We did so many fun things. And I didn't know. And every time we finished one, it was on to the next thing. And, and, and they, my friends knew, so they were the guide. And I was just going along for the ride the entire time. And it was one of the best days of my life. And it was one of the best days of my life. And I had no idea where I was going the entire time. All I knew is that I trusted my wife and I trusted my friends. You know, sometimes when you don't understand what's going on in your life, that, that's not a bad thing. Why do we associate that with bad? Sometimes when you don't understand what God is doing, you're right exactly where you need to be because God is growing you in your faith. God is teaching you to trust him. The goal of life is not ultimately to have a certain kind of life, but it is to get to know the God of the universe that you will eternally know, walk with, and love. And so we don't want to be like the lawyer in this passage that comes to Jesus trying to justify ourselves or kind of get a certain kind of answer or reality out of Jesus. We want to humbly come to God because he can do something great through our life. And so continuing on, we see the other side. We see the good Samaritan, which is what we want to be like. In verse 30, it says this. So Jesus goes into a parable. He says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. If you want to make a big difference with your life for God, and love people. Here's the second thing. Focus on your willingness more than your likeliness. Focus on your willingness more than your likeliness. And I'm not even sure if likeliness is a word, but you know what I mean, so that's okay. See, in this parable, what happens is Jesus is making a point by all the different characters that are in the story. Because this is a parable. I mean, it's not a real story. Jesus is kind of coming up with it to make a point. It's like a made-up story to reveal like a true reality. 
And what happens in this moment is, is Jesus in the story makes the priest, right? So there's a man that gets like beaten and he's like half dead on this road. And, and there's a priest that walks up and sees this man laying there in need, half dead. And this priest who's supposed to be this like, you know, really religious guy, probably really smart, has it together, respected by the culture. People think highly of him in Jewish culture. And so he's a priest and he's supposedly a really loving guy, likely to do great things. But Jesus says, but the, but the priest comes up and walks around the guy and ignores him. And there's a Levite who like, if the priests were like varsity, like the people who like kind of organized all the religious stuff, the Levites were the people that assisted the priests. They were a tribe within um, Israel. And so they assisted the priests. They were kind of like JV. So they weren't like as big as the priests, but they were still respected. And the Levite comes up and he sees the man and people think, well, the Levite, so maybe he'll do something, but he sees the man and walks around him. But then it says the Samaritan man comes up. And if you don't know already that Samaritans in Jewish culture were people they really looked down on. They were seen as people who worshipped um, just a bunch of gods. They, they weren't, you know, properly religious and they were seen as a moral people. Like the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4 when Jesus interacts with her and she's been married like five times and not living with a guy she's not married to. Like that was just what Samaritans were seen as. And so here this Samaritan man is looked down upon by the, by the Jewish culture, by the, by the religious elites. They're seen as unclean and, and not very godly. And so a guy from, from that heritage is walking down this road, sees this man half dead, but it says that whenever the Samaritan man saw him, as he journeyed, once again, just on a journey with Jesus, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And what Jesus is doing in this moment by making the Samaritan the hero of the story, or the one that's truly loving people, is he is blowing up this notion that there's a certain kind of person that God uses. That there's a kind of person, a, a class of person, a, a type of individual that's just amazing and likely for God to use. What he's showing us in this moment is that God can use anybody if they're willing. You see, we spend a lot of time telling God and other people why God can't use us. We spend a lot of time telling people, and probably just thinking in our own minds, yeah, all the reasons why God can't use me. I'm not smart. I'm not talented. I'm not good. People, I'm too busy. I'm a weak person. I don't have my own stuff together. I can't help people grow in their faith because I don't know enough about the Bible. I don't want to be a witness for my friends because I'm not perfect. I don't have it all together. And so I, I don't want to seem kind of judgmental by telling them about my savior. I don't have the right gifts or abilities. I'm not a pastor or a very religious person. I'm not, I'm not a leader, so I can't lead people. Like all the reasons why God can't use us to do great things. And listen, here's the secret. Everybody can find hundreds of reasons why God cannot use them. I could tell you a hundred reasons why I'm not qualified for God to use me to love people. And I know that you could come up with hundreds of reasons of why you're not qualified or why you're not special enough for God to use you to make a big difference with your life for the kingdom. But thankfully, Jesus teaches us in this parable that making a difference for the kingdom is not about our likeliness. It's not about who we are, how likely we are to maybe do good things, but about our willingness. See, the only thing that God looks for is willingness. The only thing that God looks for is for people who will have faith that he can use them to do great things. Like besides Jesus, who obviously was God, Every other character and person in the Bible who did amazing things was a very unlikely person to do what they did. It is the most constant theme besides just God's goodness and his redemption. But besides that, this is the most constant theme in all the Bible. That God uses broken, messed up, not very gifted people to do great things in the world if they will trust him and be willing to step out and the areas in which he calls them to, and in the opportunities that he puts in front of them to live out in their life. Think of Abraham. 
Abraham was supposed to be the great father of Israel, father of, of many, many people and all these descendants. And yet he had no kids when he accepted that call and him and his wife were old in age. Moses, the great leader leading his people out of, out of slavery in Egypt, had an anger problem. And he was supposed to be like this great leader communicator and he had a stutter. <laughs> he wasn't good at communicating. David, great King David in the Bible. Remember King David? King David sounds so official. Yeah, King David was a weak, scrawny uh, shepherd boy. Not a likely person to become the king of Israel. And when it became known that out of David's household was going to become the king of Israel, his dad didn't even bring David to be assessed because he thought, surely no way David, his own parent, didn't even believe in him, that God could use him in that way. And it just shows, man, even if your parents don't believe that you can make a difference, if we're willing, if we're willing to step out and to love people, God can do great things through our life. Every one of the disciples was a very unlikely and overlooked person to change the world. Fishermen, average people of the day, tax collectors who were not liked. They weren't great leaders. They weren't very religious people. They, they, they weren't likely, but they were willing to follow Jesus. You see, willingness, not likeliness, is the only thing God ever looks for. And what I want you to know today is that your potential is not in your talent. It's in your faith. Your potential for what God could do in and through your life is in your willingness to help. This Samaritan man in and of himself was not amazing. He didn't have a lot of money. He wasn't from the right place and the right kind of people. We don't know much about him. All that we know is that when he saw a need, instead of walking around or saying all the reasons why he couldn't help this guy, he was willing to help the person in need. And the reason why I say this and, and really point out this story is because in the coming weeks and months and in the coming year, we're going to have so many opportunities and so many needs that we can minister to. And there's going to be so many people that are open to spiritual conversations more than ever before. People are thinking about life and death and what comes after this life. People are thinking about, well, what am I doing with my life? Like, people are going to be reevaluating their life and their eternity. People will be more open to God, I believe, in the coming months and years than in the past several decades, I believe. There's also going to be great needs like financial. Like people are going to have financial. They're going to need help from other people. People are going to have like um, emotional needs and relational needs, like broken relationships and marriages. Things are being revealed in this time. There's going to be so many, so many opportunities for us to love people and to care for them. And every time we feel compelled, we're going to think, man, but, but I'm, I don't know it all. I don't have it all together. I don't have a ton of money myself. I don't know everything about marriage. I don't know everything about Christianity. But God isn't looking for people who are likely these amazing rock star people to meet all the needs. He's looking for humble, willing people, just like the Good Samaritan, to see a need and say, you know what, I don't know it all, but, but I want to try and help you. The greatest way to make an impact is to have faith that God can use you and to get rid of the mindset that says, God won't do something through my life. God won't use me. God won't use me to impact people. That's not true. God can do great things to the people who are willing. And so as we come to a close today, I don't know who's listening to this. I, I might not know you and, and I don't know much about your life but there are a few things that I do know about you. The first is that I know that God loves you. I know that. I know that Jesus died and rose again for you to die on the cross for your sins and to rise again to give you new life in him now and forever. I know that about you. I know that God has a good plan for your life. I know that regardless if it doesn't look like what you thought it was gonna look like, I know God has a good plan for your life. I know that God has good works and things for you to do, to do great things in your life because Ephesians 2 says that before you were even born, 
He had good works prepared for you that you would walk in those good works. I know about you that you wanna make a big difference for, with your life, but I also know that you're insecure. I know that you have doubts and you're not sure. I, I know you doubt if you know enough about the Bible. I know you doubt if you have the resources to really help people. I, I, I know you, you doubt just, just who you are as a person to help people. But what I know more than anything is that God uses willing people to make a big difference in this world. God uses willing people to love people in their greatest time of need. I wanna finish the last part of this passage right here. So the Samaritan man sees the guy and it says, he went up to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. And so what we see here in this moment is that Jesus didn't answer the question of the lawyer as to who his neighbor was. He just taught the guy how to be a neighbor and what it means to be a neighbor is to show mercy to people in need. And so as we come to a close today, what, what it means as a Christian to, to be a neighbor to people in, in need, it means to live by mercy and to live out mercy. It means to live by mercy and to live out mercy. See, as followers of, of Jesus, as we love our neighbors and show, their, the, show them mercy, it, it should be just like oxygen for us because we're always receiving the mercy of Jesus. That the gospel says that we're not saved because we're good people and we're not saved because we help a lot of people. We're not saved even because we're willing. We're saved because of what Jesus did for us on the cross that while we were yet sinners, the Bible says Christ died for us. So, so we're, we're saved now and forever because of what Jesus, because he showed mercy to us when we were broke down in our sin. And so we live every single day in that wonderful and abundant mercy. So we wake up every single day just living in the mercy and the grace of God. And so what it means to be a neighbor is we're also living out that mercy to all the people around us. Every day we wake up knowing God has shown us mercy. So we're living out that mercy. In Ephesians 2, verses 4 and 5, it says, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. That whenever we were dead in our sins, on that path, Jesus did not see us and ignore us because it wasn't our problem. I mean, Jesus, it's not his fault that we sinned and we rebelled against God and that we went our own way. It wasn't, it wasn't his fault. But when he saw us dead in our sins on that road of life, he did not walk around us and ignore us. But he saw us and he came for us into the world. He drew near to the world by coming into the world. He drew near to our situation, our sin and our shame, and he died and rose again for us. You see, I love that word neighbor that Jesus uses because it, it doesn't mean like neighbor by location. It doesn't just mean the people who live next to you. But the word neighbor does mean to, to be near. And so the word neighbor is saying, man, to be a neighbor to somebody is to draw near to them in their time of need and not to turn away. And as followers of Jesus, we're, we're daily drinking of the mercy of the gospel. And so as we forsake our own agenda and we go through life with Jesus, we are ready for the needs that God and his good plan puts in front of us to dispense mercy because we just love mercy and we've received it. And because we've received it, we can now give it. We know the way of mercy. So may we be a people in the coming weeks, months, and years, that as we're walking through life, as we're seeing people and seeing needs, may, may we be 
willing to be a neighbor to people, to love them and to serve them so we can live out the gospel in this season that God has given us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time together. God, I thank you for showing us mercy in our greatest moment of need. God, I thank you that you're always with us and you're always forgiving us. God, that you you never give up on us. And God, we wanna make a difference with our life. We, We believe you've given us our life for a good purpose. You have a good plan, that you have things for us to do, steps of faith for us to take, people for us to love. God, we wanna be your church. So God, help us to love the people around us. God, help us to love our neighbor as ourself. Help us to not get burned out in doing so, Lord, but but to always just be filling ourselves with your mercy and then offering that to people in need. God, I pray people look back on this season that they would just remember the church as being loving and merciful to people in their time of need. God, here we are, surrendered for you. We trust you with all of our heart. Lord, use us for your glory and for the good of all people. We pray this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you again for joining us today. If you want to take your next step, whether that's joining a Bible study or receiving prayer or maybe just following Jesus for the very first time, you can go to newdaychurch.com and click the button that says, Take My Next Step. If you also want to connect with us in any way or learn more about New Day Church, you can go to newdaychurch.com. And if today's message is one that has encouraged you, you can go to Facebook, and we would love to invite you to just like it and share it so that other people can be encouraged by it as well. But God bless you as you go forth this week and honor him in everything that you do.